reached the pinnacle of, of amazing speakers for this seminar. Uh, and in Dr. Lisa White, she's the assistant director uh, at the University of California Museum of Paleontology in, at, are located at UC Berkeley. Uh, she's the assistant director since uh, 2012. Uh, but she come, she, before that, she had a 22-year history at San Francisco State University, uh, where she would held positions of professor of geosciences, but also the associate dean, so she's seen both sides, teacher and administrator. Uh, and she's also, uh, she taught many classes that are familiar to many of you, paleontology, historical geology, history of life. Um, and she had a, uh, um, she has a passion for Miocene diatoms, if anybody of her diatom fans, you can find Dr. Lisa. Uh, and also fossil cold soup assemblages in the Franciscan complex. All right, this is excellent. So with that, I uh, definitely want to uh, uh, thank Dr. White for being here. We both have a common uh, ancestry at UC Santa Cruz and also at Stanford, so I'm very happy that uh, we're continuing the, the connection at, at Chico State. So thank, thank you, you very much for being here. Well, it's so nice to be here. Everyone has made me feel right at home, which doesn't take much. I'm always at home in a geology department on a CSU campus, so. Just live right in today. It felt like a job interview at times, though. So I am in today. <laughs> but um, I, I want to just share with you um, some of the things I'm doing at the Museum of Paleontology at UC Berkeley. It's been a really interesting new career direction for me. You know, after 22 years on a geoscience faculty, uh, this opportunity came to really focus equally on informal education, you know, and formal education. and really using um, museum collections and information that we glean from fossils to, to share with the public and with education audiences uh, so that you know, there's just more value in the knowledge that um, we obtain from fossil collections. So I'll highlight a bit about just the history of the museum. You know, some of it was new to me. I mean, I'm a, a native Californian from San Francisco, and you know, I thought I knew my California history, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm always surprised, you know, it just, uh, some of the Berkeley connections in many places, and, and some of it, you know, when, you, when you've been at a CSU for a long time, and then you go work at a UC, it's like, oh, can they be any more elitist? You know, I was sharing this with a, a few of the faculty today, that, um, you know, Berkeley's had their hand in so much over the years. You know, this year we're celebrating the 150th anniversary uh, of Berkeley, but we have collections at the museum that actually predate the chartering of the university. So there was always a center of learning um, in Berkeley. There was always, um, I think, a, a reason for scientists to gather. So that's just part of the living history of Berkeley, but I'm really more motivated in you know, sharing that history with others and, and making it matter, especially when it comes to earth science education. So I want to highlight how we utilize a lot of the information that we have at the museum um, to share publicly. You know, we've taken full advantage of the web. Berkeley was uh, one of the first websites in the world. So when the internet was in its infancy, I'm so old, actually I was already a faculty member, as some of you were in the 90s. We remember what it was like to teach when we didn't have the internet, when students couldn't just pull notes down online you know we used to make these reader books like all our notes were photocopied and it was just a different world and I, I swear I just wasn't gonna be that person that talks about back in the day how you know I had this go uphill to school and uphill both ways in the snow and I grew up in San Francisco so it's not really that but you know you don't know how good we have it now and but there were people that you know, had some vision what the web could do in terms of a learning tool, and especially for paleontology information. You know, Berkeley's always been there. So I inherited this job that always just saw the web as the venue, you know, to share paleontological information. So I'll talk about that history a little bit. Um, and then I want to highlight what we're doing with a new web resource, Understanding Global Change, that's going to build on some of our earlier successful websites. And then if there's time, I'll uh, highlight uh, some of the work I've done over the years to um, just enhance diversity in geoscience and um, uh, really uh, broaden uh, who gets to participate, you know, in our science. So, how many of you have been on the campus of Berkeley? Show of hands. Okay. 
And how many of you have been in the Valley Life Sciences building where this dinosaur is? Okay, so just a couple people. All right. Well, a question that I get often is, well, where is the museum? So people stand right here. Where is the museum? And I think they expect to see the Smithsonian. They're thinking Smithsonian or maybe the California Academy of Sciences. You know, they want public exhibits. Like, we're public university. Where are the exhibits? So, so in addition to this T-Rex, um, we've got some displays in cases, you know, around the T-Rex. And on the upper floor, there's some cases. But the 5 million plus specimens that we have are mostly behind the scene. So there's a whole collection behind that wall. The Campanilia cow, so I, I used to think that was an urban myth, that there were fossils in the Campanile. You know, that's the Bell Tower, Sather Tower on campus. And there, it turns out we, the museum has used the Campanile for storage. We've got La Brea Tar pit fossils in there. Off-site, um, along the Point Richmond shore, Berkeley has some buildings that are storage and overflow. So literally, I mean, we have fossils just coming out of the woodwork, but it's hard for the public sometimes to appreciate that when, you know, they want to see something in addition to this dinosaur on display. So a lot of my job is, oh, we do a lot more than that. You know, go to the web, you know, look up Berkeley online, come Cal Day, come to some of my programs and you'll see that you know, we really, as part of our mission, in addition to research and collections, you know, it's education and outreach, it's uh, training graduate students who are interested in, in careers beyond the professoriate. Uh, there's really an emphasis these days on just being better communicators, you know, better science writers, uh, better at giving um, public talks, and, and so we really try for the graduate students and undergraduate students that are affiliated with the museum, um, give them opportunities to, to hone those skills. So these specimens that we have that are all over the place, you know, from Sather Tower to behind the scenes and the Valley Life Sciences building to an offshore site are from all over the world. And we have an amazing collection of vertebrates, invertebrates, microfossils, yay, plants, you <laughs> name it. We've got some type specimens. And um, we have um, elemental collection, so some modern specimens that are great uh, for teaching. And our web traffic is still large, um, so more than a million hits, so page access is every month. And we've been revising many parts of our website. We're going to have a new, brand new site go online. Um, and we're finding with our audiences that um, they still go to those old pages, you know? I mean, I guess I did. When I was a professor at SF State, I had a lot of those pages bookmarked, and you know, they were the, the go-to uh, pages for me. So, I, so that's wonderful, but we're really trying to move way into the 21st century and have more apps and um, have different styles of ways that we display material. We're scanning more fossils now. We know that many um, educational uh, Departments have 3D printers, so we can replicate the fossils. But, but I love, and this especially seems appropriate here, to talk about the role of the museum in California history and in the gold rush. So our first collections were sampled by the uh, Geological Survey of California. So back in the day, in the gold rush day, so Josiah Whitney and party. So you know Josiah Whitney was the first state geologist. The highest peak in California, Mount Whitney, is named after him. So they go out, I mean, they were mostly um, mapping for gold or trying to uh, just catalog the extent of California's mineral resources, rock and mineral resources. But not surprisingly, in the Great Valley sequence, um, they were finding fossils. So these are some ammonites um, from the Great Valley sequence. And we still have these in our collection. Uh, they were finding marine reptiles, so plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs. So these uh, findings during the gold rush days predated the founding of the university. So the actual chartering of the University of California came some years later. And, but there was this history of valuing um, natural history, natural history specimens. And so Berkeley began to hire faculty that had uh, specialties and um, natural history and biology, paleontology. Uh, this building 
was where that initial uh, geological survey of California collection was. So uh, it was mostly invertebrates, um, again, as I mentioned, mostly from the Great uh, Valley sequence. Um, this building now, I think it houses um, public affairs or public policy, but it's still there. And then uh, Joseph Lacan, there's a separate building named after him, but he was the first naturalist hired. And in those days, they were professors of natural history, so that's the war. But um, then uh, they, uh, the university really uh, dedicated itself to building up the collections. Um, Annie Alexander, so she's an, an alum of Berkeley from the late 1800s, and her family um, was in the sugar business. So they had uh, sugar canes in Hawaii, and so she's the sugar cane heiress. And she went out in the field with um, Miriam and other faculty members, and, and she was so interested in natural history and really cared about the University of California that she uh, is the first um, benefactor, benefactress of, of UC Berkeley. And so our endowment that continues to grow, and even with all of the challenges any public institution faces, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have that endowment from Manny Alexander um, and her family that helped establish the, not only the Museum of Paleontology, but the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. But these are just some of the classic photos in our museum. In addition to fossil specimens, we have a lot of archives as well, paper archives, photographs, and you know, the way they did field work in those days. I'm like, does he have on a suit? Like, is that a <laughs> and then oh, I should have brought the picture of Annie Alexander because of course she has a skirt on when she goes out, but that one was tough. But um, but look, uh, Miriam was an important figure in UC Berkeley paleontology history. His he, his title was actually professor of paleontology, and so then there began to be both a department of paleontology and eventually a museum. But uh, Berkeley had uh, exclusive access to collecting at the La Brea Tar Pits. So a large part of our fossil collection, especially in the Campanile, because the fossils in that collection, I mean, they're so aromatic, you know, they smell like tar, so they needed to get them away from the main building. So, so it was great to be able to have them just be um, in, a, in a separate building that they didn't work in. And so that was another reason for storing it in the Campanile. But yeah, we still have some amazing collections of La Brea tar pit fossils. So, and I, when I give talks to uh, youth groups, I say, this was downtown Los Angeles. Can you believe it? Like 25,000 years ago, we had ground sloths, we had dire wolves, we had mastodons, and um, you know, that's our, our California history. So preserving that history um, in the fossils, maintaining the archives that are associated with um, those collections are great. And so students, undergrads, graduate students at Berkeley that volunteer um, with us or get units or get paid um, certainly get into that history. So these are a bunch of dire wolves from the La Brea Tar Pit collection. Uh, there's a faculty member that's looking at variation um, on the wolves and so we had fun uh, with this uh, when the Campanile uh, three years ago in 2015 was the centennial of the Campanile of Seder Tower. So we did some private tours of the collection and we always joked that you know we were taking the dogs out for a walk and you know, we <laughs> the wolves out to, to display. So, so we always try to have a little fun. Um, but we've also been thinking about ways to expand the, the methods of sharing the collection. So you, know, you can search our online database, you can bring up photographs, um, we've got the learning materials that my group develops, but we're also now moving to greater digitization of our collection. So there are um, specific funds that the National Science Foundation has for digitizing biological collections. So we've been doing more of that, just high resolution photographs, 3D scanning, and making those images available. Uh, we're also um, starting to develop virtual field trips. I was sharing with some of the faculty members just the work I've done over the years in the Central Valley of California, Kettleman Hills, which is where I would always take my paleo and historical students. And we've got an amazing collection from Kettleman Hills, and we're making some virtual field experiences. So 
We've done um, gigapan photography. It's just gigapixel. It's just super high resolution photography. So we've shot some outcrop photos with that and also scanned images of fossils. So we sort of integrate all of that. And we're really moving towards this uh, web resource, understanding um, global change and um, highlighting global change education that'll just allow us to just have, I think, a, a greater perspective on um, how we measure change in the Earth system, you know, how we use fossils, if we're talking deep time change, and you know what are some things in uh, the modern system of Earth that clearly are changing that we can draw some insight from um, if we study the past. And here, um, oh, this is just a, um, a uh, screenshot of the Kettleman Hills area in the Central Valley where we got some um, online resources uh, from there. Here's, oh, okay, I forgot I included these. So, so I, and I have to share that you know, I generally, as a as a geologist and as an educator, I've not been a fan of virtual field trips. I mean, we got into geology right because we love the field. You know, we can we can sit anywhere and okay, we can go to various places in the world virtually, and that's okay. But you know, you got to smell the air, get the wind in your face, get rained on. You know, it's just like that's how you get over the topics, right? <laughs> but lately, I'm like. Oh, when you're on the other side where you have to manage budgets and try to figure out how you're going to make sure students have access to all the same information, you know, virtual field trips make sense. Plus, look at the tools that we have now with, um, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality. It, it's, I think, you know, every geoscience major should have the opportunity to learn in the field. And, and I'm sure you all have required courses um, that include a field component. But we have to recognize that the field's not accessible to everybody and, you know, the, the outcrops and the places that we love in California and that, you know, we really value. Um, if you live in the middle of the country or on the East Coast, then, um, you know, your only way to experience this might be virtually. So we've, we've jumped into these kinds of resources uh, wholeheartedly now connected to a grant that is all about um, digitizing uh, our fossil uh, specimens. So, so part of the way in which um, I shape or plan what our educational resources will be next, you know, what we're prioritizing, is often connected to uh, what the research and collections priorities are, and so that's fine. I mean, it just makes sense. You know, if they have a large grant to digitize, you know, the dire wolf <coughs> specimens, then we'll do a learning. Uh, series of learning materials emphasizing that. You know, if you've got a new grant that's digitizing the invertebrate collection, then the virtual experiences are uh, connected to that too. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, you know, to just again highlight why paleontology resources are important um, and how much of sort of a fundamental understanding of Earth history can play into any um, overall uh, geoscience uh, instruction. So I, I want to show you then um, again what are some examples of what we do you know with, with that information. And if you if you go to our website so ucmp.berkeley.edu um, you'll have you know a whole bunch of menu choices. If you know you're a researcher <coughs> and you're interested in accessing our collections you can do that. If you know you want to see what some of our uh, different online exhibits are, there's a portal into that. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight for you are uh, what are our most, what have been our most popular resources online, especially for K through 12 audiences, but college audiences use them too. So um, Understanding Evolution uh, was launched in the late 2000s, so I was still on the faculty at SF State then, but I was on the advisory board for um, this particular project. And uh, it, it's, it can be a, a real challenge in some states and some districts, even in this state, to have the freedom to teach evolution in a way that it was intended to be taught. You know, scientific, it's rooted in evidence. And so it was the goal of this project to have a one-stop shop for evolution education where educators could access 
all kinds of information about um, what evolution is, what is the evidence for it, if you need a teaching unit, it's here. Uh, we have this page translated into Spanish, wanted to be sure that it was accessible to um, non-English speakers. And I think at the time, again, the, the web, the Berkeley had already launched um, just some general web pages in the 90s, but there was a, there was a, um, a real uh, dedication now and, and, and a priority to, be, to craft sites that could be of use in areas of teaching that were challenging. So that is how Understanding Evolution came about. And, and yeah, and it's amazing that still all these years later, even with you know, Wikipedia um, and just you know, going, going to Google for any and everything, uh, we're still in the top five uh, of search results in Google if you type in evolution, and especially during the school year, um, every month, you know, more than one and a half page views and have all the Spanish translations. So, so it was it was great for Berkeley again. This you know research institution, you know place that has tended to focus on the collections and serving scientists and uh, and finding a way. You know, um, highlighting a way to really draw information um, from fossils connected to a topic that would serve the education community. So after that site launched, um, it was clear that it, it, that part of the challenge in teaching evolution, I think, for many K through 12 instructors is that there can be misunderstandings about just the nature and process of science. So this Understanding Science website was launched a few years after that. And the real strategy here was to really think about you know, how science works. So you know, what is it? It's, it's not all about always you know, formulating hypotheses and proving them right or wrong. You know, science is more than that. It's a lot about just um, you know, being excited about an idea um, and conferring with colleagues. And, um, understanding how things are connected. And so this site uh, centers around a page we call the flowchart. And we have a new interactive, um, which I will demonstrate in a couple of minutes to show just the value of this. But what we have on this site are some really great examples of how science operates in a way that's sometimes unexpected. And this is such a great story, I'm not just saying it because I work at Cal now, but when the Alvarez team initially proposed that an asteroid impact led to the extinction of dinosaurs and other organisms at the end of the Cretaceous, people thought they were crazy. I mean, here's some leading scientists with this bizarre idea, but it was rooted in great science. You know, so Walter Alvarez, who's still, he's emeritus now, um, but he still teaches at Berkeley. His dad, who's a physicist, passed away. But Alvarez uh, was working at the KT or KPG boundary. Um, actually, for years, he'd been working on um, the different kinds of questions about you know, accumulation of, of sediment, sedimentation rates, and, and using um, minor elements in deep sea sediments to just try to measure uh, different kinds of, of rates of change and you know, he's a big thinker and uh, just thought a lot about um, plate tectonic um, relationships, relationships between tectonics and sedimentation. But as the story goes, so he brings the sample back and was just doing some routine measurements, you know, right at the boundary clay that he sampled and it was really high in iridium and other platinum group metals which was very unusual, was unexpected. So he sampled someone like a good scientist, you know, keep asking questions, you gather more data, you confer with colleagues. And so this story and the, the really 10 or 20 year journey from the first um, proposal that the first uh, formulated hypothesis that it was something extraterrestrial to finally the so-called smoking gun or finding the asteroid site, uh, which is where you guys, so Maybe one of the undergrads wants to tell me, so where did this uh, asteroid hit the Earth? You get time for that one. Yep. And uh, there's a sizable scar 
that you can tell from images, um, geophysical images. And then also when um, the Mexican oil company, Pemex, so they oil on the Yucatan or in other parts of the Gulf of Mexico, but there the, the reservoir rocks were um, just what they thought were going to be reservoir rocks, were an odd mix of all these freshes. So the, um, so the Mexican oil company, they had cores for years from what was the rim of the crater, were breccias, they weren't exactly sure what they were, figured they were something volcanic. And then the seismic images weren't really widely accessible. And I think it also speaks to an error, because it was 1980, when I remember I was in under, I was in my first geology class, when the article in Science was published that connected uh, the asteroid to extinction. Um, but again, it was pre-internet, pre-World Wide Web, so it wasn't so easy, you know, for scientists to communicate. So it was a good, like, 15, 20 years before geologists from PMEX, you know, were really part of the conversation. And who knows, you know, if, if they had been asked earlier, they could have told them that, oh, you know, we think there's a crater here. So, but I, but I bring that story up because it's a great way to share um, especially with, you know, with budding scientists, what can often happen, you know, when you introduce new ideas and um, how much, uh, you know, good science is rooted in, you know, a lot of these amazing discoveries that can be really unexpected too. So that's just one example on that page of just a way to really teach about the nature and process of science um, using an example of, you know, uh, uh, just an amazing phenomenon. So this is what we call the, the How Science Works flowchart. Um, and so these bubbles include what we think are, are really sort of the heart of science, you know, exploration and discovery, you know, testing ideas, benefits and outcomes, community analysis and feedback. And, you know, you notice that you've got arrows that, you know, are going and large directions and also smaller arrows going in and out of the bubbles and and that's and then we've got you know sort of the, the driving forces here in science you know you have personal motivation when you explore and discover you know you have curiosity there are a whole bunch of things um, so we really feel like this can be integrated you know as sort of a backbone in any um, science course really you know there's always a chapter in a book that's called the scientific method and I'd rather it just be called the nature and process of science. But, it, but it's important at the beginning of classes that, you know, you begin thinking like a scientist and, you know, evaluating evidence and, and you know, measuring and data and, um, and the interpretations. So we have a, a number of um, ways of using that flow chart to help uh, students, scientists, classrooms, um, map pathways to science. So all these different lines that you see in arrows is one interpretation of a pathway to science or the pathway to discovery um, after, say, reading an article. So we'll have students read articles about the Alvarez team and um, the hypothesis about the meteorite impact, and they'll see, oh, well, you know, it starts up here with having an idea and then they gather some data, and then after they gather the data, they supported the observation, or they needed they made some interpretations. Then they realized, oh, maybe we need some more data. So you know, we want it to be this um, really uh, authentic uh, exploration into how science works. So in in my own work, in my own educational outreach programs. Um, I've used this tool, this, this mapping program, um, this flowchart to have students really think about, you know, what we're investigating, you know, why we go to these places in geology, why we explore it, uh, what kinds of um, data and information do we collect, what ideas are we trying to test, um, uh, why it's important for scientists to work in teams, you need that community analysis and feedback. Uh, so, you know, it's great to be able to just, you know, highlight why science is so important and, you know, how much it's at the backbone of what we do and, you know, the benefits and um, the ongoing nature of science that it's not all about 
the end game or the final question or proving something right. Um, it's about just understanding uh, the world that we live in. So um, needless to say, you know, I'm a, a real fan of uh, some of the tools that we've developed over the years. You know, even before I was in my current position at Berkeley, um, I would use it in my classroom teaching at San Francisco State, and then when I would do summer programs for students, taking them in the field, you know, we'd always have a component of reflection and, and um, uh, just some sort of understanding and appreciation for what we do. So the Museum of Paleontology, so we've taken on the, the big topics, the topics that are hard to teach, evolution, we tried to shine some light on just the nature and process of science, so now we just think, okay, bring it on, you know, bring the next big issue of our time, which is global change, right? And we purposely have titled this site Global Change and Not Climate Change, because the change really is, is more than that. Sure, a lot of it's driven from the atmosphere, it's climate-centered, but we want to understand how other aspects of um, the spheres of the Earth, the biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere are all involved, um, lithosphere, in this kind of change, in this kind of change. So um, this fall in September, fingers crossed, I think we're finally there with this site called Understanding Global Change. And, and I think that a site like this and, and teaching and incorporating more global change science into a lot of geology classes, it, you know, could be, uh, be a way to attract more diversity in our major, you know, global change touches all of us and whether you want to emphasize it locally, there's lots of um, environmental justice issues, you know, we can highlight about how change impacts communities unevenly. You know, we of course can take the, you know, the global perspective, we're all connected, what happens at the polar regions affects us, sea level change, and this was a year I had a program with the University of New Orleans, and we were doing some sediment and water analyses along the shore. This was after Katrina. I actually spent a sabbatical just before Katrina, so I've been working with them and just trying to get kids really engaged and knowing more about the environment there and all the environmental risks. So, you know, you can touch people with this topic in particular. So we set out to develop this site, um, see, six years ago we got funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Private Foundation. and. So it's a big topic, and even though we were, you know, optimistic and enthusiastic, we still are, to just bring on this topic, it's so complex, there's so many pieces, all, all arms of science touch on global change, right? Chemistry, biology, physics, of course, earth science. How do we even make sense of this topic for educators in a way that um, they're able to teach from it? So it's just, that's why it's just taken this long, um, five years from the time that, you know, we first articulated the vision for this site um, to actually getting the site launched. And um, so what this site will do, um, it, it will have this center uh, piece as a conceptual framework that um, organizes information into the drivers or the causes of change. So they're coded red um, on the site. Um, and then there'll be a sort of uh, middle ring, uh, which is the Earth system. So that's all the spheres of the Earth, the atmosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, just thinking about how the causes of change, the drivers of change, whether they be you know, temperature or sea level or meteorite impact, how does that perturb the Earth system? And then um, the blue circle are the effects on Earth. So, you know, what happens from this um, cause of change? How does it impact the Earth system? And then how do we, as scientists as a, and as citizens of this planet, measure this change? Uh, so this, the simplest of the ring, you know, looks like this. And then we've got the four spheres, atmosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere. And it'll be interactive on the site, so you know, you'll be able to click on the different quadrants and explore what's there. Uh, there'll be written learning materials that accompany uh, the site, and so um, you can learn more about just some of the basic dynamics of the Earth system. So in the biosphere, we've got ecosystems, photosynthesis, 
respiration, we've got a greenhouse effect, atmospheric circulation over here in the atmosphere, we've got a ring even for the global energy budget. So it gets complicated quickly, but the thing we're most excited about um, are the, the graphic artist contributions to um, the icon. So we think designing it in this way that's infographic should appeal to you all, the, the next generation, because um, you're used to just clicking on icons, right? So we understand that a website with a whole lot of text doesn't exactly do it. So we're thinking, oh, we'll get them this time. We'll put some icons and make them click. You know? <laughs> but you know, and so far it's working. The feedback from teachers has been really great. And so you know, in thinking here of the red ring, so you know, we've got the lower part of the the causes ring are the longer term, you know, non-human uh, pressures on Earth. So we, when we think of global change, we, sure, we want to go to the immediate, the fast change, the things happening now. But we thought it was important on this site uh, to also make, um, to also remind people, you know, there's always change on Earth, and there are things happening on different cycles. We also realize some of the naysayers, the climate deniers, go right there too and say, oh, the Earth's always been changing. There's no global warming. There's no, you know, but just, just be patient. Like follow the logic and see what happens when you have these pressures. You know, whether they're human or non-human. Uh, what does that do uh, to the Earth system? And then how does that eventually affect uh, what we see on Earth? So these are just some different views from um, the web resource. And, um, and so what we think will be the heart of the, the resource are, this, are the, the measurable changes. So what, so what are the effects? Because that's where we often start, right? You know, as humans who care about planet Earth, as as geoscientists, geologists, geoscience educators, as faculty members, you know, we, we want students to be able to to realize, you know, the impact of all this environmental change, and these are opportunities too for us to teach and learn, right? Because you know, we can we can measure ocean acidification, you know, we can trace water. Uh, levels of oxygen. We're certainly monitoring global sea level rise. You know, as geoscientists, we certainly measure and track <coughs> the sinking of land, erosion, sedimentation. If we're soil scientists, we care about this. You know, if we're biological scientists, these are the things that we measure. So, so there's there's a hook in here for just about everybody. And so, you know, whatever your passion, whatever you are teaching to. Uh, there are some real opportunities to get more information on all of these topics, um, realize what the driving pressures are, um, and see how all of these um, different kinds of effects um, play out on land. So this is the full infographic, and we, we don't intend for someone to see this like right away or the only thing they see on the website, but we'll have it as a, as a classroom poster, you know, it'll make just a, a great poster in the classroom, and then on the website, uh, you could just, you know, again, whatever quadrant you want to explore, geosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, or whatever ring you're exploring, if you're just doing a unit on causes, you know, or systems, or changes, then, you know, you, you stick with that, but, but the reason that we thought is, as as curriculum designers to, to conceptualize a website in this way that includes not only the drivers of change, but the systems of Earth as well as the effects is a really um, terrific way to, to, to have sort of bite-sized pieces, if you will, um, from this website. So let me show you a, a couple more things and um, I will, I, hoping I can get the interactive to work, you know how it is with beta sites, but I'll share it with the department, um, and you all are welcome to explore it a little bit. So we, so we acknowledge, and we're, we're certainly enthusiastic about the infographics. Like, okay, icons, yes, people will, will at least pay attention. <laughs> and then but we know that there's too much information. So we're like, okay, we'll color code, yes. So red is always a driver, and yellow is always the Earth system. It's like that's something that's always in the background. So we're always going to have ocean circulation no matter what, right? And we're always going to have volcanism in some parts of the world. So our question on this 
particular storyboard. So this part of the website where we want to learn more about the foreseen of volcanism on extinction. It's like, well, so what all changes as a result of volcanism? You know, what are the effects? Well, you know, volcanism does emit greenhouse gases, you get airborne particles, you change the air temperature, by the way, that affects ocean circulation, and oh, water oxygen level. So you can see before long, there's like a dozen factors that you need to consider just bringing up the topic of how volcanism impacts life to eventually do extinction. You have to go through a number of steps. So we think, you know, conceptually, this kind of concept mapping where instructors and students too, you know, you can pick your poison or, you know, pick your story, you know, whatever it is you might be talking about, you know, whatever your driver, wherever you're starting, then, you know, having an opportunity to really think about the interplay between all of these concepts um, and drivers is, is just, we think it's a, it's a really good way to learn. So, you know, we've tested it with um, mostly high school teachers. The response has been great. Um, HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, they actually make a lot of earth science um, learning materials. And so uh, it, they've been really wonderful at supporting the interactive for this. And so we really hope college audiences are excited about it as well. And so the, the sort of heart of the website will be these storyboards where we've got just a, ba a basic scene. And we know some things don't fit here right. It's like, well, you know, that doesn't even look like an, um, you know, a, a margins that would go together. And you know, so we know that this is highly generalized, very schematic. But you know, we wanted to show on one figure you know, a volcano, a glacier, a river valley, and then in the subsurface and the lithosphere. So, you know, these are highly idealized, but you know, our, our goal again is to just make this topic just more more manageable to teach. You know, and and, and have some appreciation for just the science behind global change, the importance of the Earth system. I was um, talking with one of your faculty about um, you know critical thinking, and you know we understand now all the course requirements at the CSU for writing, for critical thinking, and this topic's great for it, and you can sink your te teeth into it. There's so many complexities of drivers and interplay of systems that it's just a great way to introduce students to, to science. Um, so it's been, um, it's been quite the journey for us, and these are just some of the people that have been instrumental um, in the development of this website. And as I mentioned, we had funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, which was key to developing it. And then we've added um, scientists over the years to uh, help with the um, content as well as the graphics. And so um, that's just all been terrific. Uh, so let's see if I can get back. Here we go. Um, so, so uh, we've got these two now um, interactive sites that will launch connected to uh, the global change site, um, and we we sort of hitched a ride on uh, the enthusiasm for the global change site by asking um, HHMI, so Howard Hughes Medical Institute, but they do these web resources that are important not only in biological science, that's why it's called bio-interactive, but for geoscience too. So they said that they would help us with a global change interactive, and so we asked them if they could also do one for um, how science works. So that was that one, okay. So let me see, this was getting some trouble before. Let's see if we can, dang. If we can get it to, oh, here we go, okay. So, um, so when you're in this interactive, again, a lot of earth scientists, you know, just laugh at this. I know there's some things that's wrong with this, <laughs> stuff that shouldn't go together, right? But you can import your own photo, but uh, the importance here is, to, is just to have a platform to, um, to drag and drop uh, some of those different, uh, let's see, 
Okay, so yeah, here we go. All right, so if we're trying to, you know, just um, look at some of the interactive aspects of, say, the distribution of um, continents and oceans, and say, um, you know, volcanism, and probably not going to do this well, but okay, so let's just do mountain building. All right. So we're just starting with that, and you know, say you're doing a learning material that involves these, and um, you want to just have a sense for uh, how they are um, related to each other. So you could say, okay, well, let's see, volcanism drives mountain building, and then it also um, impacts the distribution of continents and oceans. And you know, we might need a little bit more info here. And so we could, uh, let's see if I can get this thing to go. Oops. So we might say, well, um, we want to also include some other information. So, so right now, I'm just demonstrating what are our two relationships. So if whatever relationship you might be trying to illustrate, you could uh, add some more information here. You could say, you know, volcanism drives mount building by this way and that way. So you can type that in there. You could even add a photo. And this one you can say, okay, well distribution of continents and oceans does that. So it's intended to be this kind of mapping tool, a conceptual mapping tool, that's a way of illustrating how these complex relationships play out. And if we want to throw in some aspects of the Earth system, you know, we could also show, well, how does the water cycle? And, you know, of course, plate tectonics. So we could go back up here um, and we could also uh, show these kinds of relationships because plate tectonics also drives mountain building. So now we have that relationship there. So we're really excited about this kind of conceptual mapping tool that will be a companion to the site. And in this beta version that I can still share with you all if you want to just um, play around with it, the professors, to see how you might use it. Um, that would be great, we'd be thrilled. And, but I also wanted to show you this, um, so this, now that we realize, you know, there are other ways in the online environment of sharing information, it's not just a standard website, but these apps, you know, we're excited to appify or to have interactive <laughs> versions of, uh, <laughs> of all our tools. So the how science works. So uh, remember I showed you that initial flow chart. So you know that's all good. Science is exploring and discovering, testing ideas, community analysis and feedback. And so if you go through different parts of site, you could um, have students, and we've done this in classes where <coughs> they just sort of think through um, these different aspects of science. You could have students um, map or chart the course you know, of an experiment using this tool, um, you know, and sometimes in science we spend a lot of time in certain bubbles. I mean, there's some scientists, their whole career, they just gather and interpret data. Okay, so sometimes they publish it a little bit, but, you know, they really, really specialize in, you know, a certain tool. So there's that, or maybe there's this sphere, that. So these um, interactive opportunities to, again, just really think about you know, how we build knowledge, what the importance of science is, and um, how we might utilize this tool is great. And so the way this works, if, again, we want to do an interactive piece, we might say, okay, well, we're doing an experiment this week where we're um, sharing data and ideas, um, and then next we're gathering um, some data, we have some expected observations, and then we do the actual experiment. So you can use this tool, again, to just sort of keep track of what you're doing. 
And in a lab or a geology project setting, it's great because you can upload some photos here, a data table. You know, students can comment, you, know, you can attach some files, add a description. Okay, and then what happened next in the experiment? I'm just add, you know, hopefully nothing blew up, but you know, you can have that there. And then, um, you know, you still have your, your next step below that. So this is where, you know, we're moving towards, and it's been an interesting journey. So, you know, again, your third step was here, and you can, uh, again, add what uh, you did at that step. So it's, um, it's a long way from, you know, the T-Rex and the dire wolves in our collection to these kinds of products. But our goal has always been to make science more accessible to all audiences. And if we can create some tools that make that easier um, graphically, that help in a classroom setting, that can draw not only from paleo or other aspects of earth science or good science, then you know, we, we feel like that, that we've done our job as a museum community. So I will stop there. And glad to take any questions. And I probably should have tried to finish sooner, right? Is it too? But I knew some students had to so. All right, any questions? Uh -huh. um, first off, what you guys are doing is pretty awesome. Um, what other, I don't know if you really touched on it, what other outreach um, options do you do right. other than just providing educators? You know, right. So, um, so students at, at Cal, you know, they can volunteer in the museum and in turn and be student assistants. Um, but I've also been working on just getting some NSF funds for students from other universities to work at the museum or volunteer um, or just help me, you know, in some field projects I have. So I did get funding for a project that will... Um, will expand this program called School of Rock, which is not a very original name. It's <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> to have rock in school. So have you heard of um, the Joides Resolution? It's the drill ship of the International Ocean Discovery Program. So it's one of those ships that's capable of um, drilling a couple miles down in the ocean and bringing up um, deep marine cores. So a lot of my original research as a micropaleontologist was connected with that ship. So, um, so now that ship, which is in the South Pacific, actually I'm going to New Zealand in July to meet the ship, but the, so, so the ship's still coring, it's still bringing up materials, micropaleontologists are still analyzing cores, so are sedimentologists and other geologists, but now teachers can go out on cruises and learn from um, that science. And now with this new grant, I am going to recruit some undergrads to come out with me and the teachers and graduate students. And then the role of the undergrads and grad students will be to, to make some concept maps from the area where we're working so that we can have um, a series of learning materials for the teachers once they're back at school. So we'll be using the Global Change site and this site to um, just try to better illustrate what the science is, what we're doing with the science. So that's one cool new opportunity, is that, that I will definitely keep the professors here um, up to date on, because I'll be recruiting students for that. So, so that's one opportunity. It's just, it's kind of far reaching, but I've been trying to just really make sure, you know, other research groups in, um, you know, other research groups in the U.S., you know, research labs have access to these kinds of tools because we think they're great for science communication. So we have that. Um, and then we have um, some projects where we're, we're just scanning a lot of fossil um, material now, you know, just imaging. So there's those kinds of opportunities as well if students like photography and video and things. Um, so, so yeah, so, so a lot of the day-to-day -day work at the museum um, that involves education and outreach is, is just getting our collections photographed and scanned so that we can include them, you know, in these kinds of resources. 
Um, and then I just have my own pet projects. Like, ah, I miss being at sea. Like, ah, oh, I want to go back to, so I'm trying to um, do that. But I would say, you know, this, there's, a, there's so much going on in museum communities, you know, even in times where budgets are really strained. I'm just, I'm really inspired just nationally. Like the Smithsonian's got some new projects, you know, and they're opening up new wings. And, and you know, the, the money's not always available for a lot of paid internships, but you know, if you're really interested in, in museum work, then yeah, just, just ask and see what's going on. So how do you do a 3D scan? Do you have a tomograph graph? So, yeah, it's, so we um, sometimes will take, especially if it's a large vertebrate skull, um, there are some hospitals that just do um, imaging for us, so so that's good. Like we'll take things to UCSF or um, even at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, they have um, large 3D scanners. But for invertebrate shells, you know, we just have um, just a small uh, scanner in the office that you know it just takes a lot of photograph. The, the specimen yeah rotates on a, a stage, and then it's just a lot of um, photographs from all angles. Yeah. Um, for the global change site. Yeah. This is the global change yeah. site. Uh, we have all those um, icons. Yep. Is there uh, a, an effort to click on any of them and then have it to go to um, either a glossary or somewhere right. that defines these things? It takes you to another place yes. that, that really just focuses on that. Topic. Just on that, yes. So this site will um, have a, it has a glossary of terms. So all of these are defined, and then there are also. The, you know the stories behind uh, this information, so you can you know read a short essay about the rock cycle, you know, or go to another page yeah. for more in depth. You know, we'll have articles linked about you know cool stuff happening that photosynthesis researchers are doing, and yes. So the interesting thing was in the beginning of building this web resource, you know, it was a lot of content, it was a lot of text, it was a lot of definitions, and so. And the icons and the infographic, it, it, we were inspired to do that actually later on. And now that's driving a lot of our presentations. But yeah, there's a whole backbone website, which is everything you would want yeah. as a science instructor. Yeah, yeah. glossary, terms, examples, right. illustrations, yep. Yeah. So that'll be there, and then, um, yep, yeah. and lots of other resources, and then, you know, and, and how to teach. Uh, suggestions for how to teach from this topic and we also will um, give or make available to instructors we've got sheets where these icons are just on a sheet and then you can cut them out because we found you know just tactile learners so they'll have like they'll have a, this big landscape uh, schematic poster up and then the students will just take the, some have even made magnets, or you know, they've had a big page size on a table. But it's but it's great. I mean, the interactive spine with the arrows and clicking. But uh, if if you want a sheet of just all the little icons that you know you could put out on a table and make it part of an exercise that students are doing their own concept mapping, then we found that to be really effective too in workshops. It's just to work with the icons and everything. But yeah to your original question, Todd, yet, so there'll be a glossary and other kinds of information. Any other questions? All right, well, let's definitely thank her okay. for an excellent